Good afternoon, everyone. Nice crowd today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Candace Summers. I'm the Senior Director of Education here at the McLean County Museum of History. And uh, first off, I want to thank our live stream sponsor, uh, WGLT. This program is being live streamed thanks to WGLT, Bloomington Normal's public media part of the NPR network. And it also is being recorded, so I will ask you to mind your P's and Q's. <coughs> Don't say it unless you want it to live on the internet forever. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, we are pleased to um, welcome uh, Robert Sampson here uh, this afternoon to give a talk. I'm gonna hold his new book up. Ballists, Deadbeats, and Muffins Inside Early Baseball in Illinois. If you don't have your copy yet, we still have a few left for sale down in our gift shop and visitor center. And uh, Bob will be uh, signing copies downstairs after the program as well. Um, in case you didn't know, although I bet a lot of you do, uh, Bob is a former newspaper reporter, congressional aide, and a writer at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and he's also the editor of the Journal for the Illinois State Historical Society. And for 31 years, he's played vintage baseball, a game without gloves, and the rules and uniforms and custom customs of the mid-19th century. Um, if we run out of copies of his book, you can also get them online. There's a nice little card up at the front with a QR code to make it super easy for you. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Sampson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You want to catch it? <laughs> Those are. Those are recreations of the type of ball they would have been using, and that'll become important as we talk about uh, uh, how they played. Whoops, here we go. So thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I better be on my best behavior today because there's too many people in the audience I know and who know me. Uh, so uh, I, hope I, I hope they won't be too disappointed. Uh, so uh, we're talking about uh, uh, baseball comes to Illinois between 1865 and 1870. And this book is really, I think, as much a social history as it is a sports history. And we'll get into that in a minute, why it's really sort of hard to write a modern sports history about baseball as it was played uh, during this time. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Illinois uh, in these uh, uh, years before we get to the actual details of the Bloomington Club. We can get this to work. <clears throat> oh. This is why I was a history major and not in tech. Uh, oh, oh. Is that what? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we want to go back. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, whoops. If you uh, look over here, there's a map, uh, and each of those pins represents a town 
that has uh, a baseball club. There were over a thousand that were formed between 1865 and 1870, and we'll talk a little bit about their nature. Now you might say, well, what did the color uh, uh, indicate? Nothing. <laughs> I, I, I was too cheap to buy the same color. Uh, <laughs> But, they, but you know, if, you, if you get up close, you'll see that almost all of these teams, with only a few exceptions, follow one of two paths, railroad lines or rivers. So the game is spread by uh, avenues of transportation. Uh, and when you get out in little places in western Illinois or southeastern Illinois uh, where you don't have that sort of connections, uh, you, we didn't find as many, many teams. So there's over uh, about 1,000 clubs in that uh, first five years. Now, uh, clubs were just what we say, a club. Not like the Chicago National League Baseball Club or the St. Louis National League Baseball Club that we had today. Those are corporations, right? They're only a club in the sense that it makes them feel a little good about themselves and have a touch to the ancient past. But these were actually clubs. Like you would have a, today you might have a stamp club or a book club, which essentially brings people together who have a common interest to pursue that activity. So uh, that's what they're doing here uh, with these clubs. And a club might have uh, a first nine, that would be the top nine players, and a second nine, and occasionally even what was called a muffin nine, and as you might imply by the name Muffin, that's not going to be a high-skilled player. And there's a whole other story on those. Uh, these, uh, uh, most baseball, though, was actually played within these clubs, you know, in what we call like an inner club game, or more importantly, unorganized baseball out in the streets or on the courthouse square. And you only find out about unorganized baseball when it causes trouble. And it caused a lot of trouble in Bloomington, uh, which we will get to in a minute. Uh, these were uh, primarily uh, uh, clubs that were as much social as athletic. When the baseball season's over, they're having dancing balls. They're, ha they're having ice cream socials. They like to associate uh, among themselves and also with other clubs. You know, think of these clubs as also like Rotary or Kiwanis. They were what we would call today networking. Uh, they were getting, uh, meeting people uh, and moving up uh, in the world. Uh, their games were played on rough fields. So if we get in a time machine, uh, like from the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, Mr. Peabody's way back machine, and we go back to 1865 and we want to see a ball game, don't go looking for a nice manicured infield with baselines and nice stands and not a tree inside on the field. You're not going to find it. You're going to find a field maybe that's going to have a creek running through it, might have a tree in left field, uh, bushes. Uh, it's wherever there's open space. And that's a, uh, another interesting path, which we're not going to go down now. <laughs> maybe somebody wants to ask questions about it later. But the uh, the value of open space in these communities, and that's a, that's a real challenge for these baseball clubs to find open space uh, to play on. Uh, also, the game has changed in 1865. Before that, uh, you're handling these balls. I want you to maybe get a, great, a better appreciation for what I'm going to say next. Before 1865, you could catch that ball on one bound for an out. After 1865, if it was in fair territory, you had to catch it on the fly. So they're not wearing gloves. There's no gloves, there's no protective equipment. So you're sticking that paw up and you're gonna try and hang on to a baseball that's going 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, depending on how hard it's hit. And uh, as you know, the collision of something like that with soft tissue uh, can often lead to unfortunate results. Uh, and still does today in, in vintage baseball. So this is, a, uh, this is one of the reasons, if you get into the, looking at the scores, why are these scores always in double digits? Because they couldn't field. <laughs> you know, and I don't blame them. You know, it's that eventually they start to pick that up. But these early scores, you know, uh, 57 to 31, things like that, very not uncommon, because the balls were flying all over the place and they were getting dropped 
and uh, runners were going around the base like a, a horse race track, and you couldn't keep track of them. Uh, so no gloves, no protective equipment for uh, catchers. So this was a game that took uh, more than a little bit of physical courage uh, to do. So who we have up there now? So uh, a big part of it, though, this is the rule book from 1867. And uh, if you looked on the inside, you would discover, well, gee, there's hardly any rules in here. <laughs> What's taken up all this space? This is by Henry Chadwick. Henry Chadwick is the, uh, not really the father or the creator of baseball, but he's the fellow who really uh, popularized, helped popularize it and guide it. And he's a very influential guy in things like statistics, batting, you know, the uh, batting averages and all that sort of stuff. But he's insistent as the founders of the game or as the game evolved that it be a gentleman's game. It wasn't all about winning. He has a great line in this book. Much of this book consists of how to organize a club, constitutions and bylaws, and then descriptions of fielding positions, how, what type of person should be first baseman, what type of person should be a, a, you know, a catcher and all that stuff. But here's what I think is the really telling line, the one line in this book that tells the whole story. Don't elect bad-tempered men in your club, no matter how noted as players they are. Leave them out for they will eventually do more injury to a club than, uh, than uh, benefit. So I don't, last I looked, the Chicago Clubs, Chicago Cubs or Chicago White Sox or any major league baseball team wasn't running a character test. Uh, you know, does, this guy, does this guy play well with others? No, you know, if he, can, if he can hit the ball out of the park or he can throw a baseball 112 miles an hour with a snap curve on it, Okay, we don't care what his personality is. This is a whole different world. We're talking about a whole different game that during this period is going to undergo radical transformation in just these short five years. Uh, these rituals and customs included, a, they, they aren't necessarily written down, but they're expected. You know, sort of in polite society, we don't have things that are written down, right? but we're expected to behave in a certain way in certain situations. So in this case, uh, this is going to be a little taste of how these were. You were supposed to meet a visiting team. If a team came, say a team comes from St. Louis to Bloomington to play Bloomington, you're supposed to meet them at the railroad station and give them a tour of the town, buy them a meal. Uh, you know, the, the fans are expected to cheer good plays by the team from St. Louis as well as they won the ones from Bloomington. Uh, when the game's over, uh, the captains give a speech at the end of the game praising the other team uh, and, you know, saying what noble set of fellows they are. And then they uh, sometimes, in one case, actually marched arm in arm together off to a hotel where there was a big banquet and speeches and stuff going on for hours. Uh, so this is, you know, we don't see that uh, today at any level of baseball. Uh, so there was this great spirit uh, of fun uh, that was involved. And sometimes that uh, spills over into the coverage because you really don't have any professional sports writers in Illinois. These are fellows who are covering politics or uh, runaway horses, you know, little tidbits for the local page, or in the case of Danville, runaway pigs. They had a pig, pig stampede in Danville, one of my favorite incidents of the whole research. Uh, but uh, so these, you know, and so this game is new to them. People haven't seen it before. So they're constantly learning. The players are learning, you know, as they play, how to catch these balls and stuff like that. The spectators are learning, well, what's, why is this happening? What's going on? And so all sorts of stuff gets into the coverage. In fact, the game stories are almost impossible to figure out. You can't, it, people will suddenly appear on base, you don't know how they got there, and then they're gone, and you don't know what happened to them. And then they pop back up on the bases. You know, what happened? Uh, here's a great story from a, a game between uh, Peoria and Bloomington. And, and this, this, this occurs in the third inning when, quote, a fat Englishman in the crowd persisted in getting in the way and at this stage of the game created some disturbance. Now, you, like me, would like to know, well, who the heck was this fat Englishman and what was he doing to create a disturbance? But they don't tell us. All we know is that uh, by the fifth inning, 
uh, or the fourth inning, they got him quieted down. Uh, maybe he was drunk or, or whatever, but anyway, they got him quieted down. Unfortunately, then, while the game was underway, a female goose came on the ground and waddled towards the shortstop as if to take his place. But a ball from Stearns, player from Peoria, drove her from the field. So we now know that the attempt by a goose to play baseball in Bloomington in 1866 was prevented by a line drive. And that was the, so you know, the first and last goose ever to play in a Denny's baseball game. Or ba baseball game. Uh, so why uh, then, that's sort of our background, uh, you know, a, a, a big picture, a broad, uh, broad brush stroke of what we're looking at here. Why, why, do, why do I say it's the curious case of uh, Bloomington Baseball Club? Remember the curious case of Benjamin Button? Now, this, Bloomington doesn't go back in time or, or age, you know, in the same way. But it is a curious case. It is sort of unique. Uh, well, all, I guess all stories are unique. This is sort of unique but it, uh, among the, uh, baseball clubs of the time, but it also reflects a lot of the troubles that other clubs had and why by the end of this period, by 1870, there is not a single amateur adult club in the field. They've given the game up and it's been taken over by juniors and at the highest level by a couple of professional clubs. So let's see if we can get this through oh, again. All right, Bloomington Baseball Club. Uh, it was formed, where is it? Right over there. Is that the Livingston Building? Uh, that where the uh, Mystic is? Where's Mystic at? What direction? Okay, wherever Mystic is, that's where it was. Uh, that was this gone, that building, but the, on the first floor, a fellow we're going to meet named Colonel jo uh, George W. Lackey had his drugstore there, and he was one of the leading figures. Uh, and they had their first meeting in that courthouse, which we were just talking about a while ago, that burned down in, what, 1910? Sometime. Uh, 03? <laughs> so uh, a lot of these teams were organized in courthouses. What does that tell us? Well, okay, it tells us one thing, a courthouse would be a site where there were a lot of public meetings. It also tells us that these players tended to have a little bit of status in their community where they could just easily get a room in the courthouse and conduct their business after the courthouse was closed. Aha, get a little bit of social uh, history in here, understanding who's playing the game and what their connections are. Uh, so, uh, the curious case uh, for me about Bloomington, here are some things. Uh, it, was, uh, it was affected by the problems that were common on all clubs to some extent or the other. Gambling, yeah, oh boy, there was everywhere. Uh, and one of these players on the Bloomington Club, uh, was we, who we will meet in a minute, I think later establishes a pretty good reputation in his life for uh, uh, dipping his toe into those waters, so to speak, a guy named Lee Shaney. Uh, Overcompetition, certainly a problem that affected uh, uh, Bloomington. In other words, we really want to win. You know, all this uh, hail fellow well met, that's fine. You know, we'll go through the motions, but at the end of the day, we want to beat these guys. And maybe there's going to be some resentments. Well, that's just too bad. Uh, creeping professionalism, uh, because we're, we'll get into this too. They, you know, they're, they find ways to pay players under the table. If anybody here is familiar with big time fast pitch softball, you know, they don't pay those guys over the table, they give them nice jobs. Uh, in Decatur years ago they had a team from ADM. All those stars that came from New Zealand and Australia suddenly were much in desire for lucrative positions at ADM. Uh, well, you know, and they won a national championship, so I guess it was worth ADM's investment. And then finally, uh, also, particularly in the case of Bloomington, maintaining playing space. Real problem here, and we'll see what happens. So the questions uh, that make Bloomington curious to me is it, why, if it was one of the top four clubs in the state, and it was, if, if, you know, hard as it is to determine, you can say with a certain amount of confidence that Bloomington was certainly one of the top four teams based on its record, and maybe in the top three. You know, you could argue it was maybe closer, maybe in the top three. Uh, why did it suddenly stop playing uh, its 
area rivals after 1867 and go to what turned out to be a disastrous experiment in playing East Coast, traveling East Coast teams. They would go to Chicago, they'd take the railroad down to St. Louis. On the way between, they would stop in Bloomington and get a little exercise by pounding uh, the Bloomington Baseball Club by double-digit scores. That's discouraging. Uh, why did it generate or get caught up in so many controversies? Uh, I think sec probably only second to the Chicago Excelsiors, uh, the team everybody loved to hate. Uh, Bloomington had more trouble with other teams uh, than anybody uh, I can mention, and uh, Lee Cheney's one of the reasons. Uh, and why? Uh, was the Bloomington Baseball Club and all baseball players banned from playing baseball within the city limits of Bloomington. They threw them out. At the height of their, of their fame, they were kicked out of the city and had to find a location somewhere else. This is not the case in Springfield, for instance. And there's a, I did a article on this wants to go all the details, but it's a very different approach to baseball in Springfield because the people that have the clout in Springfield, and I mean major league clout, are behind it. And in Bloomington, there's groups here that have clout, and for whatever reasons, even though some of their sons or they might be playing themselves on the team, don't like it, and it gets kicked out. So we'll, we'll begin with the organization of the Bloomington Baseball Club, May of 1865. Colonel George W. Lackey, who got that title for basically sitting on his uh, haunches in a uh, camp in Missouri for a few months. He was one of those limited, limited enlistment guys, but he retained the honorary title, of, or I guess the title of Colonel Lackey. He was a druggist and a tobacconist, had a little drug and tobacco store. He had a brother here. Uh, who are the members of this club? They're primarily white collar. Uh, you, uh, people in their late teens, early to mid-twenties. Lackey and maybe a couple others were Civil War veterans. Uh, again, Lackey was not a combat veteran of the Civil War. Uh, the mayor of Bloomington, Mayor Rood at the time, uh, R-O-O-D, was a member of the club. And he was probably, I'm certain, he was one of these second or third nine guys that they would just go to get together and play. He wasn't, I never saw him in a box score as part of the first nine you know, when they're playing Peoria or St. Louis or something like that. Uh, a future sheriff. Uh, sons of local politicians and big shots, uh, which is not uncommon in all throughout the state. And at the back of the book, uh, there's an appendix uh, which uh, list the people we could trace by occupation for all these, for about, I think about 100 teams. Uh, and that's pretty instructive too, is who was, who was involved and who wasn't. So, uh, two working class guys. Our old friend, Lee Shaney, and one of my favorite players, Patrick J. Keenan, an Irish immigrant uh, who is, we shall see, Bloomington's first professional baseball player. Not Lee Shaney, not Haas Rodborn. He's the first guy that is lured away from Bloomington to play baseball for money uh, in 1867. And I think, you know, I'm hoping that nothing else, this will gain that poor fellow some recognition because boy, he certainly had a miserable life after baseball, uh, which we shall see about that too. So what are some examples? Well, Bloomington really broke out of the gate and caught the state's attention. In 1866, there was a club up in Rockford called the Forest City Baseball Club, and that's probably the most famous one from that era. Why? Because their pitcher. Anybody know who pitched for the Forest City Club of Rockford? He's in the Hall of Fame. Albert Goodwell Spalding Jr., yes. Uh, and he becomes a really big deal the next year. So Rockford is uh, the Forest City Club sort of feeling their oats, and they stage a tournament uh, on the fairgrounds, uh, which uh, the racetrack infield of the fairgrounds, in which uh, a later commentator says uh, had more hazards than a modern golf course. Uh, it's, you know, and so one guy says, it's amazing somebody didn't break their leg. There was a big drainage ditch running through the outfield. They had teams from Detroit, Chicago, 
a couple other places, and Bloomington went up there with only nine players. And Bloomington beat Milwaukee, the cream, the cream City team, which was pretty good. And then they beat the Chicago Atlantics, which was the second team in Chicago, setting up a championship game with the hated Excelsiors. Excelsiors used to refer to these other places like Bloomington and others. Well, they're just, they're just country teams. We don't, we're not going to play them. Well, now they are going to play one. Remember I said Bloomington only had nine players. They were so beat up from those first two games that they couldn't put nine players on the field. Or the other version is that the Excelsiors were worried they might get beat, so they got the Atlantics to insist, well, before you play the Excelsiors, you've got to play us again and beat us. It's still unclear what happened. All we know is that Bloomington was awarded second place, which is curious because there was no, you know, there, no other game. Uh, and uh, they took the train back to Bloomington. They were met, I think, at probably the old Illinois Central Station. And they were so banged up that they had to put some of them in wagons to bring them downtown to this courthouse square where there was a community celebration uh, probably a band in the middle of the night to welcome back these conquering heroes. So they were really, they were on the rise. I mean, this is, that was quite a feat. Uh, that, uh, uh, so that uh, same uh, summer then, uh, actually in September this month, 1866, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have our own tournament. And they invite both those Chicago teams. And I guess the Chicago teams had a rare lapse of judgment, and they said, oh, we're going to go down there. We're, 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 going, to, you know, we're going to feast on these country teams. St. Louis, the St. Louis Unions, very good team uh, in the St. Louis area. Uh, Peoria, Lincoln, uh, other places around came up, and it rained almost the whole week. Uh, they were, uh, Bloomington was ahead of uh, St. Louis, the Unions, 44 to 10 in the fifth inning, and the Unions left the field, got in the train, and went back to went back to St. Louis. Uh, their next game was going to be against the Atlantics. Ah, rematch of Rockford. This is going to be really highly anticipated. And it was in the ninth inning, the game was tied. And this was sort of unclear what to do at that time. So they had an extra inning. So in the top of the extra inning, Chicago Atlantics score three runs. Bloomington still has a bat. And they're coming back. And it looks like they're going to pull it out. But Lackey, according to the newspaper, becomes overexcited on third base and gets caught in a rundown between first and, I mean, third and home and is tagged out. And the Atlantics go off with the win. And then they end up uh, losing to the Excelsiors for the championship. But then again, there's sort of these you know, sour, sour feelings about the uh, thing. Uh, the next year. Uh, July 4th, 1867, they go to Springfield for another big event. Uh, this is a July 4th celebration at what was called Railway Park. Railway Park is now completely built over. It used to be called West Springfield, now it's Springfield. It's about, probably about a mile west of the capital. Um, but at that time, it was the terminus of the Capitol Horse Railway. That was like a streetcar, except it was pulled by horses, which is owned by Jesse Dubois. Some of, you, some of the historians remember, remember Jesse Dubois, a big Republican, and a lesser-known guy who was a Democrat uh, named uh, Starn, S-T-A-R-N-E. Both of their sons played for a team, interestingly enough, called the Springfield Capitals for the railway. So, okay, why are these guys building this park? Uh, here at the end of the terminus. Well, think about it. You've got a, you've got a horse car railway. You want to get maximum fares, right? You want to get people on those cars. Well, they're not going to ride the car to the end of the line unless there's something at the end of the line. So they build a pleasure ground, a picnic area, a ball field. They, they flood it in the winter for ice skating. They have political rallies there. They have pigeon shoots there, anything you want. If you just want to go out there and lay around, but the only one way to get there, Capitol Railway. So you got to throw those coins into the thing. So this is held there. They actually put on special cars on July 4th. Everybody in Springfield is going. And the prime one of the prime attractions is going to be a rematch between the Bloomington Baseball Club 
and the St. Louis unions, who they, unions got on another train, they're always getting on trains and coming to Illinois, this is the last time they will, but uh, up till now, uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they're, they're uh, same result at the start, early in the game, uh, Bloomington's leading, and then the skies open up, Some, you know, something about rain and baseball at this time that seems to go together, so it really pours, uh, they have to stop the game, uh, spectators join in and trying to drain and clean the field, and the uh, umpire says, all right, we're, at three o'clock we're going to play. We're going to play now. St. Louis captain comes out and says, no, we're not going to play. This field is unsafe, and I'm not going to put my players on it. And the umpire says, you got ten minutes? In the ten minutes, he declares a forfeit for Bloomington. St. Louis player comes, uh, St. Louis captain, and gives another speech. These guys, if you're going to be a captain, you had to be a public speaker at that time. You're always in demand. Uh, and then they get on the train and go back to St. Louis. Bad feelings. And this really is treated uh, in the newspapers uh, more negative towards Bloomington than it is for St. Louis. And in fact, it, one paper says it's no honor for Bloomington to declare a victory in this game because they didn't win it fairly. Uh, so that, that leaves some more uh, bad feelings. And then it spills over into the newspapers. And this is, often happens too. These disputes on the field get picked up by editors who had nothing better to do, so let's stir this pot. And there's, you know, at one, at one point, uh, Bloomington, the team of Bloomington is accused of being uh, a, bang, a, a, a gang of roughs. That's a bad term, you don't want to call them by a rough. A rough followed by gamblers and blacklegs. Now, to show you how bad blacklegs was as a term, Henry Clay fought a duel with John Randolph in the 1820s because John Randolph called him a blackleg. Uh, it was a very unsavory character. Uh, that was the connotation. I believe it's from Shakespeare. So uh, this finally died out uh, when uh, the St. Louis team denied having said that and Bloomington uh, accepted it, but they never played again. Uh, again, the, the rivalry with the Chicago Excelsiors. After that failed Bloomington meeting, which never happened because they lost to the Atlantics, they're constantly trying to get the Excelsiors to play them. Every other, at least once a season, sometimes more, they send a challenge. That's what you do. You would send a challenge to the other club, and they certainly were expected to respond, and then you would agree on you know, time, location, all that stuff. Well, Chicago wouldn't, wouldn't respond. And uh, this went on for a couple of years. Finally, in, uh, I think in 1868, they do meet uh, in Chicago, uh, and there's a dispute about that game. The umpiring supposedly was uh, loaded in Chicago's favor. Chicago won. They played again in uh, Bloomington, and Bloomington got ahead, and Chicago got mad and said the umpiring's rigged and got in the train and went back home. So we're seeing, oh, okay, what, what, what did Henry Chadwick think about this? Uh, you know, foul-tempered men? Well, it seems like there's foul-tempered men everywhere in this game now. And that was what was going on. Uh, then they get involved in the great tournament of the Western states. I know one person here knows where this is. Maybe more. Anybody besides me and her been here? What is this? No? You're on the... Think farther west. It looks the same today. How many have been to Fairview Park in Decatur? Yeah. Okay, that's Fairview Park in Decatur. This is one of the few places, maybe the only place, of all these old fields where you could take a bat and a ball and play a game today. The trees are gone. It's the center of the infield of the, uh, of the track. And you can see this would be a very interesting play to play a baseball game on. This was the great tournament of the Western states, much ballyhooed. They invited everybody, I think, from New York to Missouri, and hardly any of them showed up. But again, the Excelsiors, the Excelsiors are coming, and the Bloomington Cubs coming. Payne is there, Centralia is there, Decatur is there, a couple other places, Springfield. But the big idea is, okay, this is Bloomington's chance because these are probably the two best teams, and they're going to rise through the ranks and play for the championship. Well, then why, as soon as the Bloomington team gets off the train in Decatur, they start lobbying the other teams who are there, the Excelsiors are going to be a little bit late, 
to ban the Excelsiors from the championship bracket because they're going to arrive late. And when they cannot get the other teams to do that, the Bloomington guys get on the train and go back to Bloomington. <laughs> you know, if there was ever a game tailor-made for them, because it wasn't raining in Decatur that, that September, it was a hot, dusty uh, day. But they left, they left their junior team, and that would be a team that players 18, 16, somewhere in that range. They had one good player, though, really good player, Lee Shaney. And I was talking to Candace a while ago, you know, you can look at this guy and you know he's trouble. And he was trouble all of his life. And it starts, well, I don't know it starts here, it probably started earlier. He is playing on the senior club roster and also on the junior club roster, which that's in this book. <laughs> and that is illegal for obvious reasons. Well, he stays with the junior club, uh, and uh, the Springfield uh, Athletics, which is their junior club, not the Capitals, the Athletics, they go out to play. Well, they know Lee Shaney, I guess. You know. Well, he's an ineligible player. Umpire won't do anything about it. So, okay, we're gonna get on the train and go back to Springfield. So now, you can imagine being the, the organizer of this great tournament, you know, a lot of people haven't shown up here. You've got a lot of bills to pay. You've got a lot of prizes you're going to have to pay for. You've got to have people to give them to. And the way it looks, there's not going to be anybody to give them to. They're all getting on the train and going back where they came from. Pena, the Pena Excelsiors. That was a very popular name. A lot of Excelsior clubs running around. Very good team. Probably one of the best teams in downstate. I would have liked to have seen them matched with the Bloomington Club sometime. They stepped forth. They just got through dismantling, uh, dismantling the Decatur team, the McPherson's by, I don't know, 102 to 3 or something like that. And after five innings, they said, okay, that's it, we're done. And, they, and so Pena was available, and they come out, and they get a lead on the Bloomington Junior Club. And then, uh, as I said in an earlier article, I didn't say it, I used it in the title, the spirit of discord arose which is a kind way of saying people lost their tempers. And the Bloomington captain and the players were incessantly yelling at the umpire, which is something you didn't do. You were not supposed to address the umpire at all. And complaining about this, that, and the other thing. But they had Lee Cheney on that roster, and they still couldn't beat these guys. So they got mad and left the field, got on the train, and went back to Bloomington. Uh, which was, uh, uh, that then drew a lot of negative attention to Bloomington. So we're seeing here this sort of a, uh, a, a, trouble, a troubled uh, record. Uh, what's going on? But already they had been hit, Bloomington had been hit by professionalism. In the summer of 1867, there was a team called the Washington Nationals, not the guys that are there today, they have little W's on their hat. This was, they worked for the Department of the Treasury. Uh, and they were basically baseball players who had nice jobs with the Department of Treasury and that allowed them to get off at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and go on long trips across the country. And this was a tour of the Midwest. And they took Henry, Ch no, that's not, we took Henry Chadwick, the old guy in the chair, with them. And he wrote these games. And they went through, they went through Cincinnati and Cleveland and St. Louis and just demolished the best teams in the West. Get on the train, they're going to Chicago. They get up to Chicago, uh, so they're going to play the Excelsiors, and there are a lot of gamblers involved in this, uh, you know, making bets right and left. But the, the day before they're going to play the Excelsiors, they're going to play this country team from Rockford, the Forest City Club, with a 16-year-old pitcher named Albert Goodwell Spalding Jr. And Goodwell. Spalding Jr. and his teammates defeat the best team in the country, 27 to 24, something like that. It shocks the nation. So the gamblers really go crazy now because they're really putting money down on Chicago for that game the next day because, well, if Rockford can beat the Washington Nationals, you know, they're going to have to take uh, the Nationals back to Washington in a basket. <laughs> We're going to dismantle them. Well, the next day, the Nationals obliterate <laughs> the... Uh, the uh, Excelsiors. Just, that's really sort of the beginning of the end for the Excelsiors. It's that they can never live that down. 
almost as bad as any Cub fans here remember the fall of 1969 and the loss of the, <laughs> as a Mets fan, I like to remind people about that, but anyway. Uh, no, uh, so uh, uh, Chicago being, uh, you know, the city of big shoulders and thinking ahead, they said, okay, we got to get some help. So they go down to Bloomington and they try and recruit Bloomington's catcher and, and Keenan. Keenan was the pitcher, apparently a pretty good pitcher. They get Keenan and he goes back to Chicago with them. And they also then later on get Spalding and he has a nice cushy job in a grocery store which he gets paid more than anybody else in the grocery store and uh, basically uh, plays ball. It doesn't really work out, uh, but, uh, but they're very upset about it. Bloomington goes nuts about this. They're already mad at the Excelsiors anyway, right? And now they've stolen one of their best players and tried to get another one. Uh, so this goes up and down the state, and every, almost every newspaper that wants to gets, puts its word in edgewise, puts its word in bad-mouthing bad uh, uh, Chicago for doing this, because this is unheard of. Playing, paying somebody to play, play baseball, that's unheard of. So, uh, the next thing that happens, 60, 1867 is a very bad year for the Bloomington Club. This is, the, this is where they played. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm all cattywampus. What would be north, northwest of here? That, okay, I got two different things. So, somewhere out there. Anybody know what this is today? There's still a building there. Bent School. Doesn't look like this because all of this, all of this is full of houses now. But that was the Fifth Ward School grounds and that's where they played. That's where that tournament in 1866 was. Uh, so uh, in the summer of 1867, actually in the, about May of 1867, city councilman gets up and says, I'm getting complaints from my constituents uh, we need to ban baseball in Bloomington, causing all this unorganized baseball. You know, I, I, I'm, this is a hard for me to believe and probably hard for you to believe, but there are actually accusations that some of these players, I hesitate to say it, are using foul language. <laughs> and loudly enough that it carries across the street. Uh, and you know the noise, balls flying out of the field, breaking windows, you know, I don't know, just general stuff. And the mayor, remember the mayor of Bloomington's a member of the club. This thing goes to what today I guess we'd call a second reading. So it, it rolls over to the next week. The mayor gets up and offers an amendment saying, okay, uh, let's amend this uh, ordinance to say that if you are an organized baseball club, because there were only a couple of organized clubs, the Bloomington Club and its junior club. The rest of them were just people who went out and played baseball. If you're an organized club, that means you have some accountability, you can play. Uh, the only two votes for that were Rude and somebody else. And so boom, at the end of the council meeting, baseball was banned. You could be arrested and fined for it, playing baseball within the state limits of Bloomington. So they move out to the, uh, what's now, I think as Bill pointed out to me one time, probably the driver's license station, somewhere the old fairgrounds, right? In that area out there. I, you know, I don't know what's underneath that. We could dig it around sometime. Yes? That's where the Harvard prostitution Well, that's a good, a good connection then, yeah. <laughs> Not the first or last connection between those two activities. Uh, so, uh, uh, I like the little, Spice and color there, thanks, yeah. Uh, so they went out there. Now that was only after they had abandoned an idea to go to Central Driving Park, which is a whole other controversial thing. A Central Driving Park was going to be, it was a race course, which I think, again, is roughly where Holiday Park is now. And if you want to see an interesting discussion of the, what the public morality was at the time, read all the letters back and forth about the dangers of this horse racing track. Uh, in this uh, fine uh, community. So uh, they, they lose their field. They're the only team that I came across that actually lost their field. Uh, yeah, so it's an interesting place, you know. Uh, it's, 
I don't know what point, and it's not really important, they decide to sell off the rest of that lot, and the school faces differently now. I think it faces to the south, doesn't it, the main, the main entrance of Bent School. Uh, but again, that's one of the places where you can actually get close to where they first played baseball. The next mistake they make is this decision in 1868 to start playing these Turing teams. Uh, bad news all around. Uh, you see the Philadelphia, that's the, more, uh, that's the Morrisena, we call it Morrisenia, that's Bronx today. It was called Morrisenia then, New York. Uh, they were the best team in the country in 1868. They came through. Uh, Brooklyn Atlantics, also one of the top teams in the country. Uh, the, Buckley, the Buckeye Club of Cincinnati, Ohio, which included two future Cincinnati Red Legs on its uh, roster. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Philadelphia, I mentioned the Philadelphia Athletics also. Uh, Philadelphia Athletics, 1,000 to 1,200 people came out to watch that game at the fairgrounds. Probably paid money. I'm sure they had to pay money because they would have had to pay Philadelphia to stop there. Uh, they're, they're, I, I won't bore you with the scores. They're all double-digit scores, and Bloomington's on the short end. Uh, so that was, you know, this experiment, okay, you know, we're so good, we can just play these top teams, doesn't work. Uh, plus, the guys are getting older, you know. Uh, apparently, uh, Keenan's having some, he's not as effective a pitcher as he used to be. That's mentioned a couple of times. Lackey is getting in these, in these mid to late 20s. He's not going to be any faster uh, than he was. So that doesn't work out too well. The pet ultimate, oh, okay, okay, look, did we do the muffin games? Yeah, let's do the muffin games. The muffin games, that, those were, these were things, real quickly here, that were created and became very popular. Uh, number one, to sort of celebrate the joys and fun of the game, but also to take some of the sting out of this increasing professionalism and controversy and gambling and stuff like that. These were games that were designed to be incompetent, you know? Uh, I would have great success as a muffin player in the 1860s. I mean, the, the, least, the, the less you could do, the, you know, the slower you were, you know, you were, loved it. And they would have these games between doctors and lawyers and, and clerks of various stores and fat guys and thin guys and married guys and single guys. And people would come out by the scores to watch these games because everybody was in on the joke. You know, the players laughed, the fans laughed, the reporters loved this stuff. We have an example here from uh, Bloomington. Uh, this, was a, this was a game between the lawyers, and lawyers taking charge, imagine that, uh, challenging the ministers, the doctors, the professors, and the bankers to, quote, a muffing game, and the, and the game was described as a muffing game played by lawyers who made a brief game, or a game, or a game of briefs of it, against kid glove professors who demurred to holding red hot balls and yet Stowell marches undismayed by the presence of the limbs of the law and the presence of 63 spectators and two small boys. <laughs> the game only lasted five innings because, quote, the surgeons and their assistants got sick of the game and concluded five innings were enough. <laughs> and uh, there's a whole chapter in the book on, on muffin games. Uh, this was their final mistake, the Bloomington Club. This is the Anybody know uh, what, these, what this team is called today? That's right, yeah. Not the, it's not the American League, which I think the American League team now plays in the International League, doesn't it? it hasn't it been dropped down the classification? Not the Major League team anymore? I'm a fan of that club, too. I, uh, two last place teams. Uh, so this, but this is the Chicago. They, the the, the uh, Excelsiors go away when somebody steals their fence. They had a ballpark, they come back from a road trip, somebody has stolen their wooden fence, that's it, we're through, they close it out. So 1870, local people say, we gotta put some money, we're, we're a rising city, we have to have a club that can compete. Uh, so this is the Chicago White Stockings, they come down here, and uh, well, in uh, seven innings, they have a 62 to six victory over what was called a volunteer nine, because by that time, the uh, the Bloomington Baseball Club is long gone. This point now, this is, this is clearly, it's 1870, you got two professional teams. You got the Rockford, the Forest City Club, which is professional, Shaney's playing for them, and you have the Chicago White Stockings. Uh, the White Stockings will survive. The uh, Forest City plays, I think, one year in the National Association. Uh, they drop out. Uh, then in, in 1876, Chicago interests 
basically undercut the National Association and create the National League, which has been around ever since. Uh, so, and now, by that time, the game is played. Inner city competition has really increased, and so it's really all about winning at this point. Let's see if we can get this going. Oops. Colonel Wacky, uh, that's in Batavia. No picture. He dies fairly young. I think he probably used too much of his own product. He dies of emphysema in Chicago uh, at a fairly young age in his 40s. He become, in Chicago, he became known as a drill master. They used to have these voluntary National Guard units, and his was the one that specialized in something called zoavis, and that was a fancy form of drill at the time. You can look it up, it's Z-O-U-V-A-E or something like that. Uh, quite intricate. Here's my favorite, he's still in Bloomington, this guy. There he is in Evergreen Cemetery. That is his house. It's on the uh, east side of South Main, about uh, two doors down from the Walgreens. That's the house he died in. He uh, essentially uh, worked in taverns, uh, has, uh, is arrested from time to time after his baseball career is over. He uh, gets drunk one night and falls through a plate glass window and goes to jail for that. Uh, caught in a gambling den. Uh, hangs on uh, into 1917, has a stroke, and dies in that house. Uh, I, another, as I said, another person I think that should be uh, recognized and hopefully will in the future. Uh, let me read how, this is the uh, only time I'm going to read something to you here, and I'll make it quick. Here, uh, this is I'm trying to imagine when he's in the, when he's on his deathbed. One wonders whether the bedridden Keenan reflected on the days when he and the Bloomington Baseball Club challenged and sometimes beat the state's best. In 1877, a Chicago newspaper printed an informal list of early professional players by year. Keenan, without a first name, was listed for 1867, the last time his name appeared in print, connected with baseball. Left unmentioned in the article, or decades later in his obituary, was the November day in 1867 when Patrick Joseph Keenan bested Albert Goodwell Spaulding in an Excelsior intra-squad game before Chicago fans crowded around the field, outscoring him two to zero on the base pass and outpitching the future Baseball Hall of Famer in a 24 to 13 victory. Perhaps the cheers sounded in his memory of a day when he and the game were young, beckoned by a promising future. Once Keenan and the others enjoyed a clean slate on which to write their dreams in a game for men of muscle and men who wish to acquire muscle. Today we imagine their ghosts playing amid joking, laughter, and repartee on fields now paved or abandoned, overgrown tangles of weeds and saplings. So, blow the cymbals, beat your tin horn, sound a loud blast on that squash vine. Their game begins. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful program. Um, we have time for a few questions. If anyone has any, wait, wait, I got to get microphone so our friends at home and online can hear you. Uh, just two points. Yep. One, my grandpa, born 1865 on a farm in Vermilion County, always referred to it as town ball. Town ball. Did you ever hear that? That was, a, that was an earlier game that was played in New England, and it had five bases. And it may have been played in some places as well. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't what we would recognize as a baseball modern baseball, but that was a, it was a ball and bat game that was not uncommon, but it's eventually then superseded and lost to baseball. Okay, but, but he certainly was aware of it. Yeah, I mean, they might have been playing it in rural Vermilion yeah, County. Yeah. You know, like when we were kids, you might play a, well, you would call it a, a game where you only had like five people on a side, or you would figure out something, you know, and I think that's how some of these games survived, because they didn't have a full 18 people or whatever. Or whatever. Okay. But it was a game, you're correct. And the other point is, anything about race on this? <laughs> I have a whole, ch there's a whole chapter in here, and I didn't get into it because it would take another 20 minutes. Uh, 
but yes, there was a very good team in Bloomington. There, were tr there was trouble in Bloomington. At one point, the, uh, a group of black players had to literally fight to retain their field, which is somewhere on the south part of town. They, became, they played for the state championship in Springfield in 1870, and we were able, thanks to Bill and over Chris, right? Yeah, over there, uh, to trace several of their players throughout their lives. Did they just play blacks? Yeah, there are, I only found a couple of examples in Illinois where you had interracial uh, games. Now, that's not to say there wasn't, because given the standards of the time uh, and the rules of the National Association of Baseball and, Players. And that's still Jesse Fell's era. Yeah, they, your club could get kicked out if you played a black club. That was the rules. That's, that's the rule that they had to repeal, you know, that the, the segregation rule in 1867. So that, that was a, a rich history, and it has a chapter in the book. So, gambling. Yeah. How much did the betting line have to do with all those teams who abruptly decided to take the train home? Well, it certainly affected it. You know, it, it's more of a problem in, with that whole thing in Chicago with the Washington Nationals. But then, in 1869, there's a game in uh, Quincy for the junior championship between Quincy and Springfield, in which the crowd, partly because of gambling, becomes so unruly that they interfere with the game. And the umpire, our old buddy George W. Lackey, actually at the end of the game gives a speech and admonishes the crowd, saying, you know, I've been in b baseball for years. I'm the president of the Illinois Baseball Association. Blah, blah, blah. I have never seen a more disgraceful you know, uh, scene than this. And it was a great shame uh, about that. So, uh, but that was also a blame. In a game between Centralia and Mount Vernon uh, that same year, uh, they anticipated trouble. They met in a, a neutral space called Ashley. Find Ashley on a map today. That's a good afternoon exercise. And uh, each team packed rail cars with local toughs, local roughs, because they knew there was going to be trouble. It was a close game. At the end of the game, a new uh, battle started out with fists. Somebody fired off a gun. Uh, so, and that again because of the gambling, which went on during the game. You know, it's not like okay, put our bet and see what happens. They would be betting back and forth during the game. So it was, it was, uh, it popped up. That was my bit, one of my big surprises. How prevalent it was. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but yeah. Any other questions? The map. <laughs> Every, I got, I got like, a, I got like five ring binders with all the teams, and every time I would find a team, I would then get one of these pins, and I would go and put it on the map, and then sometime I would have to go to Wikipedia or old maps because some of these places no longer exist on Illinois maps, or they've changed their name, and so it was, it was. Uh, so what, what was the original source of this information? Who, who wrote it all New, down? What? Newspapers. Every time I found a, a team mentioned in a newspaper, and then there was, there's another list called, uh, there's another list that's uh, uh, pro something, as, uh, which is contributed to by volunteers. So between the two, most of them were mine, but with theirs added, I was able to get over a thousand teams. There were more teams, I'm sure. Why do I say that? Why do I say there are more teams? I only have this many, I only have a thousand because a lot of these places don't have newspapers that survived. And if the newspapers don't survive, and if they didn't play somebody that had a newspaper that survived, they're lost. So there might be 50 more, or more than that. Uh, but, you know, maybe people will keep finding them as we go along. Well, that's all the time we have for questions now. But There'll be time downstairs when we move downstairs for the uh, book signing. Thank you all once again, and thank you, Bob, for such a fantastic program. And um, we'll see you all downstairs for the book signing. Thank you.